Can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So um, thank you for choosing my talk again. Uh, I am very surprised that this happened. Uh, my name is Dorota Czaplejewicz, uh, and to make it shorter, because my name is rather long, uh, I, my nickname is DCZ, as you can see here on the, on the slides. Uh, I, I promise to talk about uh, ways uh, in which you can break into Linux systems. Uh, there are going to be some ways that I thought about um, during the last year or so. Um, um, recently, uh, they have become more relevant uh, because I started working at Purism on the Librem 5 project, and those ways of breaking into systems still apply for for a phone. So, um, these are going to be a couple of examples of attack vectors that are rather unusual in that they do not just uh, they are not just simple bugs, but more. Uh, general issues with um, the models that we operate with. Um, but let me show you exactly what you mean by starting with examples. So first, uh, there's the category of attacks which can be done over the web. Like everyone here is using the web. It's really hard to avoid running any code from the web in the form of JavaScript. So the, these are the attacks that everyone should be aware of. and the first one, oh, well, let's, let me explain why there is a plus there. The plus there is because the attacks are not limited to the web. So they start with the web, but they extend to other levels of security or to other areas of computing. So the first attack, which is possible to execute, execute with JavaScript, is Rohammer. Rohammer is the attack which is, is a class of, is, is a kind of a vulnerability which is related to how memory is built. Rohammer basically allows an application or whatever code is running on the CPU to flip uh, an arbitrary bit in the memory and hope that something happens because the bit has been flipped. And this can be used to, for example, break out of sandboxes. It has been demonstrated. There was a proof of concept uh, of a JavaScript exploit that used Rohammer in order to become um, to, to break out of um, to break out of the security sandbox of the browser. It can be also be used to gain root privileges by a regular application. So this is not limited to the web. So what can we do about it? We can use some software mitigations, which are perhaps a, a, a good uh, way to, to deal with it, but they are not the proper solution. The proper solution is to change how memory works. There is a special technology which some memory, memory uh, manufacturers are using, which is called TRR, which, is called also, which means target row refresh, which will make sure that bits cannot be flipped. So this is something that you can, as a customer, perhaps you can buy memory which, with target row refresh, but also you could buy systems with ECC, which might be a, little, a bit difficult, especially in terms of laptops, but it's probably worth it. Another attack is the class of vulnerabilities uh, called Spectre. Spectre is another hardware vulnerability uh, related to how CPUs uh, process data from, um, from different security areas, so to speak. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, let me just say that Spectre is allowing um, attackers to read what's happening, read the contents of memory which were they were not supposed to read. This is also something that can be done using JavaScript in a browser, and it's very hard to defend against. There are some software mitigation which, with mitigations which require uh, recompiling uh, code, perhaps patching the CPUs, and the, real, the, the actual solution that's the, the best, the, the, the proper solution is to replace your CPU. There, uh, with 
uh, either a simpler one that's not trying to be as fast as possible or uh, an actually a fixed CPU. Unfortunately, uh, Intel uh, or AMD do not have any fixed CPUs, but they are coming in the pipeline. But meanwhile, you can uh, use uh, slower CPUs, which are somewhat simpler, such as Cortex A53 or the Sci-Fi Hi5 CPU, which is one of the RISC-V CPUs. Um, yeah, as I said, in the future, x86 CPUs are also going to be uh, resistant to this attack. And this here is the local vulnerability class. Um, the local vulnerability class is some is something that happens even though you don't want to, but it's caused by an application that you downloaded. Let's start with screen recording or key logging. This is rather obvious. We don't want a random application to record the screen and send it somewhere. Uh, we don't want an application to record your passwords. What can we do about it? We can use Wayland, for example. Wayland has uh, protection uh, in terms of uh, how, watch, how easy it is for an application to record the screen, and it also doesn't allow a, a random, a ra an arbitrary application to log the keys, unlike X. So if you want to get rid of this problem, use Wayland. Another symbol, similar problem is access to sensors such as position, like GPS, camera, microphone, acceleration. This kind of stuff can reveal things that you don't want to to random application authors. You don't want the camera to look at you when you are not, for example, talking to someone. You don't want the microphone to be, us to be uh, used by an application when you are not aware of it. The same thing with uh, position. So what can you do about it? It's, it's rather, s it's, it's the matter of sandboxing or using kill switches. It, you, we can sandbox um, sensors access, like for example in Android, w by specifying permissions, or you can have a hardware kill switch, or like a laptop cover, uh, or for example you can take, um, you can flip your switch on your computer if you happen to have a, a Librem laptop, um, yeah, so this is this is uh, r very related to the next class of vulnerabilities, which is why is there accessories? It's supposed to be files access. Uh, if uh, and uh, if you download an application by default, when you run it, it's going to uh, access. It's going to be able to uh, access any files of your user. It's not always good if those facts. If those files are, for example, your secret password or something like that. What can you do? You can do sandboxing again. Flatpak does it uh, in such a way that um, that it makes use of portals. An application cannot access your files until un until you allow it. The next vulnerability is direct mem memory access, and this is a mechanism that makes your devices fast. For example, hard drives use it to reach the speeds of what is it now? 200 megabytes per second. And this is like very important, but something that you cannot easily get rid of. There are a couple of solutions. The proper one is to use IOMMU for fast devices. If IOMMU is basically memory protection, except this is a hardware feature. So buy laptops with IOMMU. Uh, IOMMU is rather common in laptops. It's not so common on phones, as far as I'm aware. But the better solution is to use free firmware so you can trust your devices. Um, a similar problem is with drivers. When you do not have IOMMU and the firmware is closed, the driver may, may allow any application to change any memory area because the application can tell the driver, hey, can you read this uh, piece of code that only root can do? So uh, this is kind of a, another play, uh, another issue that, mm, that will allow a random device or a random application uh, get your, all your data or even modify it and install your s in install itself as in a permanent place so that they could control your computer for a uh, long time in the future. 
Uh, there is another uh, issue uh, with which can be done by applications. If an application gets access to the root user, they, the application can install itself somewhere in the boot process, and this is really difficult to 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 find because the application basically gets to do anything it wants. This can be mitigated by by using a core boot system, which has uh, which has. Uh, the, the new solution uh, made by Kyle Ranking, which is called Heads. It basically verifies that no files inside boot have been modified, and that makes your system secure uh, through the boot process. Physical problems. Physical, uh, as in you have to actually get access to the device. Online is because the device has to be online, as in turned off, ten, turn on. First problem is brute forcing pin. If you have a weak password, you could probably brute force it, and this is not very difficult. Like if you had a padlock, which is a, a, a code lock, it takes 20 minutes to, to break it with four numbers. What can you do? You can limit the attempts as a, as a distribution on, try on trying to open the lock, and then you can require a really the actual secure password. This helps a lot. But there are more problems. Connecting new devices. Uh, whenever uh, there, there was a talk before about Thunderbolt and about connecting devices which would get access to the PCI bus. You do not want that if you do not trust the device, because that device could exploit some bugs, and that makes you makes them steal your secrets. The same issue is with USB. You do not want to uh, to attach a random hard drive, a random keyboard to your computer because it could like execute some commands. It could pretend that it's a keyboard and it could enter some code into your terminal, open the terminal and send some data, who knows where. So you sh it's, it's very important that USB devices are approved after they are plugged in. This is something like, um, uh, I, th I think Max started using that, or iPhone. Whenever you connect a new device, it has to be uh, uh, it has to be uh, confirmed unless uh, it has to be confirmed with your new password unless you access the device in the past hour or so. Um, yeah, so that's the mitigation. You have to have some sort of permission systems. Uh, the problem with switching the kill switch. Uh, if you have a kill switch on your device and the kill switch is about a communication device like a modem or something, you can control the state of the device once you have it in your hands. So if you want to make sure that, uh, if you have observed, that, oh, I know this, there is, was one device which had the address ABC, for example, and you want to make sure that the one sitting in front of you is the same one, then you can just turn on the kill switch and you see, oh, this is the same device as I saw earlier. Uh, that gives the attacker the, in the information that you, as a, the owner of the device, might not want to give it. So what's the solution? Have another software kill switch protected by password. This is basically the same case as a connecting of a new device. OK, now there is the most inter more interesting part of attacks. Uh, the physical offline attacks, when you just get access to the device, but it's turned on. So removing storage and reading all files. That sounds very simple until the disk is encrypted. I think that doesn't need any more explanation. Altering BIOS is also uh, an issue where you are dealing with someone who, well, basically has electronics experience. Uh, it's very difficult to detect unless your laptop, unfortunately this is, as far as we're uh, only applies to uh, x86 systems, unless your laptop has a TPM chip. The TPM chip is responsible for making sure that no hardware has been tampered with. And there are some general tips. The first tip is what to do where your credentials are stolen. Well, there's not much you can do, but you can prevent it by using smart cards for two-factor authentication. Smart cards are devices which can store your password, your, your key or to your computer or to some online service, but they will never normally give that password to the attacker. So even if someone steals your smart card, 
they might not be able they, they will not be able to see what the key was they might be able to use it to authenticate but then all you have to do is revoke the smart card uh, the last issue that I want to talk about is Intel ME, Management Engine, and AMD Platform Security Processor, I think it was. Uh, well, these are the, some things, that, that these are some, some uh, important parts of uh, x86 CPUs, which are impossible to disable as of now. Um, they control the CPU even before the operating system starts, even before the BIOS starts, and they are really impossible to get rid of, so the solution is to change your CPU. Well, that might not be so easy, but that's the reality. Hopefully, uh, we will get some other CPUs which are powerful enough uh, to be used as desktops. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions,